attention. Um, okay. And the way you can see the agenda, that should be updating live if we have everything working well. So you'll be able to see the presentation as we go through it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've, yeah, give me the whole. So yeah, I've got my meeting. Uh, I, I've got the agenda as of uh, what we got last Friday, I guess. Yeah, so we have that, and then we have a presentation for the first item. Right, okay. So Matt. Yes, Tom. When, when I'm talking, do you, does it does this go out over the the speakers in the in the room there, or is it just yep. to you folks? Everyone can hear you when you speak. So don't swear. Okay. Pam says not to swear, but we will start <laughs> our meeting. I'm going to call this meeting to order at three o'clock, and I'd like to do a land, land acknowledgement and recognize that we're holding this meeting on the traditional territory of the Seashell Nation. Um, declaration of conflict. Would anyone like to declare a conflict? Seeing none, moving on to adoption of agenda. Would somebody like to? Um, excuse me. Uh, there's opportunity at the end of the meeting to speak. to the corporate officer to confirm um, the bylaw mentioned. Um, Mr. Chair, the procedure bylaw does state that, so it would require a unanimous vote of council to allow, to basically amend your agenda to allow a delegation to speak. Uh, it doesn't have to, you don't have to do it. It just says if you, the council could do that. And you also can choose when you do it and have a delegation before the meeting adjourns or what have you, but it's completely within your purview. Thank you. So I'm gonna look for council for somebody to move a motion if they would like to um, receive this delegation. Um, and if you could specify when you'd like to receive it too. Um, I'd like to find out what the delegation would like to speak to us on and whether or not it's pertinent to what we're talking about today. Okay, I'm going to defer to our guest. Oh. Okay, thank you. So still looking for that motion. If anyone would like to make it. Councillor Toth, what would you like to move? Um, I will move that we accept the uh, Gary Patterson as delegation. Um, can we do it after business items, just before adjournment? That way, if anything comes up during the presentation, it may be pertinent to what you want to speak to. Okay, so I'm seeing 5-3. That's sure. your intent. Okay, and I have a seconded by Councillor Rowe. 
Um, is everyone clear on the motion? It has to be unanimous, as I understand. It's not. Tom, yes. Councillor, Councillor McLean. Yep. Yep. Was was she was was the delegation speaking into the microphone at the at the desk there or not? No, sorry about that. Oh. Yeah, that's fine. Because I, I didn't hear what was said. Okay. Um, so we'll make sure that happens moving forward. And to yep. the corporate officer. Mr. Chair, because a unanimous resolution is required, it, I believe it would be appropriate to just sort of summarize for Councillor Lamb what was the question asked and what Ms. Patterson answered. Okay. Um, so we are looking at a delegation from Ms. Patterson regarding procedural fairness in regards to the budget. Process, procedure, and procedural fairness. Okay, so we have a mover, we have a seconder. I'm gonna call for a vote. All in favor of receiving this delegation. And Tom. Aye. Okay, Tom's in favor, so that's unanimous consent. So we have an amended agenda with the delegation at item 5-3. Okay, moving forward, any other amendments to the agenda? Seeing we'd like to move adoption, Councillor Toth, Councillor Scott, all in favor? Perfect. Aye. Moving on to new business, I don't believe we have any new business. Business items 5-1, preliminary general operating budget overview. And I believe this is a presentation from the Director of Financial Services. And I'd also believe it'd be appropriate to receive the report. So somebody yeah. to receive, I have Councillor Rowe, Councillor Toth, all in favor of receipt of the report. Aye. Thank you, Tom. And I'm gonna pass it over to the Director of Financial Services. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So uh, the last budget meeting we had was on the sewer operating fund and we walked through, um, through that. And um, so we're, today we're starting uh, with the general operating fund and uh, this this topic will take several meetings to go through and answer today is kind of an overview uh give you some ideas on where taxation has uh gone with regards to uh new construction and other things um we will uh so let's go to our agenda here so we'll review the services that are included in this budget which are uh, a mid full uh, we're going to look at some 20 assessment information that we have to date. There'll still be a, a more assessment information coming out. Um, then I've provided some tax information that we'll go through. Um, I've uh, got a couple slides on the 2020 draft general operating budget. And um, then we're going to just walk through um, estimated um, DCC balances and reserve balances. And the last thing we'll look at is a slide um, just on the look at the value of the assets uh, that are included in this fund. And uh, the last slide will be just what's going to come up at the next several meetings. And um, so we'll go from there. So the general operating fund is where we spend most of our uh, operating funds. Um, we, uh, in this fund, we have the airport administration, arts and culture, building inspection, building maintenance, bylaw enforcement, communications, uh, corporate services. Uh, this is where we also pass out community grants. Um, we fund economic development, engineering, finance, financial services department, human resources, IT, library, line painting, mayor and council are also uh, budgeted in this area. Parks, planning, public works, RCMP, risk management, solid waste, street sweeping, and wharves. So quite a wide range of um, services that are provided in this fund. And as we get going in the budget, we'll hear from each one of these departments and uh, we'll review their, their budget and give you opportunities to ask questions and, and find out what's, what's in their budgets. So our revenue sources for the general operating fund, my, uh, mostly taxation, and then we have fees and charges, um, investment income, penalties on, uh, on, um, on taxes. Uh, we get a small community grant 
that can be used for operations, a 1% utility fee. Um, other grants that we get, um, traffic fine revenue, business license revenue, building permits, solid waste fees. Uh, the next one is a new one for us, which is a Recycle BC incentive. And um, so we get approximately 17,000 a month for, from that program, <clears throat> which uh, we'll talk about uh, more in when we get to that budget. Uh, planning fees, engineering fees, land leases, and facility rentals. Generally, the expenses include wages and benefits, contracted services, material supplies, travel, accommodation, uh, legal fees, advertising, insurance, memberships, training, software, hardware, bank charges. Uh, this is also where we charge out our audit fees, um, our library services, our CMP contract, hydro, natural gas, and fuel. So now we're just going to do a small review. You have um, the next slide you have in your agenda as a document. And it was provided because we knew the slide wasn't going to show up terrific um, on, on the screen here. I'm just going to go to the mic here. So, um, so this is uh, what we have to date on new construction uh, from BC Assessment for 2020. And um, what it's showing here is that we have, uh, for residential, we have uh, $20 million of new construction. And that's a, that's a total out of the residential. But when you look at the details, Nope. Yeah, the presentation's made as a convenience. Um, the printed copy is in the agenda to the corporate officer. Okay, um, I believe everyone at council has a viewable version, so we're going to continue on. Okay, so the... Um we're going to spend a minute and, and talk about this because our actually our new construct number was uh, $34 million. But because we had a significant write down in residential this year, the new construction number is $20 million. So it shows right here, residential other, there's a $14 million reduction. And that, that is the properties that are uh, that have been yes, written down. So I talked to BC Assessment the other day and um, and so you know this is what we're going forward with which is a 20 million dollar uh, new construction value. Okay, does everybody understand that? So it was 34 million dollars however because of the write down to the Sea Watch properties the new construction number is only 20 million. So just to look back in history a little bit, uh, last year we had $64 million of new construction. So, you know, a significant difference from, from 2019 to 2020. And if we go back one more year, uh, new construction value was $69 million. So, over the last number of years, you know, it's uh, declining a little bit in the new construction, but with that hit on um, the Sea Watch properties, it's just kind of made it that much more. So this is just uh, kind of a first look at taxation um, with the new construction numbers. So unfortunately that little box is in there, but. With the new construction number, we're looking at a lift of revenue of $68,000 this year, just due to new construction. So $68,000 so over last year. So when we say a 0% increase, your, in, your increase to revenues is $68,000. Okay? Any questions on that? No? 
Good? Okay. Okay, so the other one that's important for, for us to review and look at would be the assessment changes due to market. And so um, over the last number of years, uh, the market, the, um, the assessment due to market has gone up. So we went from 2.6 million, sorry, way more than that, 2.6 trillion, I guess, in 2017 to 3.2 to 2019 of 3.6 and for the first year in many years we've seen a reduction this year to 3.4 okay so I think that's about a five and a half percent decrease and we'll show oh no 4.96 percent increase so this has been the increase in in uh, assessments due to market over the last number of years and I know I'm highlighting really the residential. That's kind of the biggest one that is will come up and down. Um, so anyway, you're seeing a 4.9% decrease this year in uh, the assessment due to, to market. The other one that went down slightly was light industry, went down 0.44. Business and other, you know, was held its own 2.74 uh, increase. But when you look at previous years, you know, you're going from a 12, 9 to 11, down to 2.7. And then uh, this slide just shows a comparison of the types of properties that we have within the district um, by class. So residential, utility, uh, supportive housing, uh, light industry, business other. And as you can see over the years, it changes very slightly. So in 17, we had 321 business other properties. Uh, this year we have 330. So in four years, you know, it's a increase of nine. Uh, residential, we had 5,600 residential properties in 2017 and 5,800 in uh, 2020. These numbers could change as uh, BC assessment goes towards their last review of all the, uh, the assessments and things like that, but um, we don't expect them to change very much. So I just wanted to do a quick review of where we've been with um, property tax increases over the last number of years. Uh, this is showing about a, about an 11 year history and um, with that, they've had uh, they put the CPI on the left side of the screen, and um, so property tax increases through DOS. Uh, just going back a um, couple of years, uh, eight point four five last year, which included a three percent for capital and a five four five point four five percent increase uh, for general operating. Previous year, 5.41, which is a 3% for capital and 2.41 for uh, general operating expenses. And then an 8.18, uh, 3% and 5.18. So then previously, um, you know, it was uh, all over the place uh, in the previous years, but significantly less. So this is um, this is uh, basically a report you get off the province's website. It, it shows um, the value of a representative house in the district of Seashell, uh, which is valued in here is at six hundred and seventy nine thousand dollars. And then it shows all the taxes that are pulled for not only the municipality but for uh, the school district, SCRD, hospital, district, hospital, BCA, MFA. Um, giving you a subtotal and then we have down below there's there's four parcel taxes in that um, two are for the regional district and the remainder uh, are the ones for sewer and garbage for the district so included in the parcel taxes is uh, a water parcel tax for 263 that goes to the region and uh, SCRD recreation parcel tax for $112.67. So, so the next slide, uh, oh, it's just a quick comparison uh, between um, 
a representative home in Seashelt and in Gibsons, and what taxes are pulled from each each uh, municipality for uh, the use of the towns or the, the district and town. And um, so, you know, the you can see that you know we're very close in the level of taxation. There's a, a little bit of a difference, probably about two hundred dollars a home between Gibsons and Seashell. So we're back to that first slide that I showed you a minute ago, but what I'm trying to highlight here now is uh, how much the municipality gets, or the district here, uh, gets for its general operating purposes per home. So on a house valued at $679,000, the district only holds $1,495 to pay for the expenses. The rest, the rest, other than the parcel taxes at the bottom, go to other levels of government or get pushed out. So, so exactly what does Seashell get? Well, we get two hundred sixteen dollars flat tax per home for solid waste. We get the fourteen hundred ninety five dollars, and then the sewer fund, which is not associated with the general operating fund in total gets $645 per property. So now I've, I'm just showing you a list of other municipalities that have a, what I was looking for was, has a fairly high regional district charge and to see what kind of municipal tax they pay um, when regional districts are quite you know, cover probably quite a bit of the cost, you know, uh, in the area like recreation. And um, so Gibson's, their average homeowner pays for municipal taxes, $1,165. Uh, Central Saanich, which has, you know, a reasonable regional district fee, uh, the municipal, municipality collects $2,200 for an average home. And Parksville collects $1,700 on an average home for the municipal purposes. Uh, Qualcomm, $1,961 for an uh, average home. Uh, Rosslyn was another one that uh, was up there a bit, $2,175 for an average home. Goes towards municipal tax, municipal costs in the general operating fund. So, you know, really, you know, the, you know, what I guess I'm trying to show here is the $1,495 we charge is probably on the lower end of the average municipality or municipalities that, um, you know, have a high regional comp component to adding services to the, the area. So now we're on to the 2020 draft budget here. And um, so, this, um, so this slide shows uh, all the transfers to and from all the other levels of government in this number. So uh, gross revenue would be $27 million. Uh, total expenses, including the transfers to other governments, 31 million. Uh, included in there would be depreciation, so we kind of bad bad the depreciation number, so we come up with a, a deficit number of $1.1 million is where we're starting. So essentially this is a very similar slide, except I've pulled out all the transfers to and from uh, the other levels of government and the revenues from the other levels of government. So this really shows you what we collect for what we need. And uh, so, you know, the revenues we collect basically for us are one, uh, $14 million, of which $9 million is uh, taxation. Uh, pass it to Mayor Seegers. Thank you. So what this is showing, and clarify this for me, yes. what I'm seeing is we are writing off each year some of our equity in our buildings, our equipment, et cetera, to the tune of 2.4, in this case, $2.4 million. Yes. And for operating, we're short $1.1 million. Correct. But we're not taking into account any of that capital. So we're actually short 
if we were investing in capital as well, um, close to what, four million? Uh, yeah, if you add them together, yes, yeah. 3.5. Right. Yeah. And we, we've been collecting 3% each year yes. to put into trying to make up that 2.4 number. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll clarify that a little more in a sec here, too. Um, yeah, so we're starting here. This is just basically our number for us. And um, so, you know, we have a $14, $17 million budget, you know, 14 in revenues, expenses with amortization of $17 million. Adds up to the same number, $1.1 million. So this is um, just... This is about as far as we're going to get into numbers today. Uh, there's three slides in a row, and this is uh, revenues. And it's just a little more detail. It uh, makes up that $14 million that we just saw on the slide prior. So majority of it comes from property tax. We have $9.4 million from property tax. Uh, fees and sales of services is our next big number of three, $3.085 million. Uh, investment income, which has been better over the last number of years, uh, 462,000. Uh, grants and donations, uh, 1. 1.09 million dollars. And then a uh, small amount for other revenue of 33,500. And then uh, just a quick look at our expenses. Uh, and once again, we're going to go through all these departments and, and specifically, uh, we'll get the department's heads to come up and, and we're going to go through and uh, find out what's within these numbers. So general government, uh, 3.5 million. Uh, planning, 1.2. Community services, $2 million. Public works, 2.1 million. That's pub, uh, parks is in there as well. Uh, facilities, 670. Police services, 2.2 million. And solid waste, uh, just over a million dollars. So you'll see that our expenses here only add up to 13 million, and the, that one slide showed 17, but we have to show you the debt payments and things to come here yet. So, so included in the budget, we have that amortization number that uh, we we put in here and then uh, principal payments of 517,000 uh, built into the budget is a $720,000 transfer to reserves. Now that would be gas tax as part of that. So that's a capital transfer for, for gas tax. And uh, this is where the buildup of 3% is, is right here in the 966 that's a transfer into the reserves. So that's um, so that number is two hundred and forty thousand greater to the three percent. I think it's just about two hundred fifty thousand dollar increase with that three percent. So we've kind of built it in for now, and, and we'll discuss it as we go forward. And then we add back the depreciation, and there's your deficit number of one point one two five million. Any questions? Uh, seeing none, I think you can continue on. Okay. Tom, do you want to jump in with anything? No, I'm good so far. All right, let's keep going. Okay. So as we get going here, because we're starting to look at other departments and uh, what costs are going to be showing up, um, it's good to know where our reserve balances are going to be estimated because we're going to, we'll be definitely looking at them for capital as well as um, there's a few operating reserves that we're going to talk about as we go through the budget process. So I want to give you those numbers uh, right at the front so that um, uh, when we get going, you know, we, we have it and it's all ready to go here. So DCCs, um, we have the four sewer drainage roads and parks. Uh, the sewer one, we're estimating the balances here at 2.2 million for sewer. Drainage, 142,000. Roads, uh, zero. Uh, parks, um, 656,000. Now we do know that through the year end process, 
there may these change these numbers will change a little bit. This is just estimated for now. We did get a small contribution for roads and I think drainage, uh, but they're very small. They're you know ten thousand or so, not not huge. So as we get those numbers firmed up through the year-end process, this will change. Uh, in our statutory reserves, and once again, there'll be a new one added here next next time, which is we've uh, moved our gas tax money into a statutory reserve. Um, we'll do that at year end. So when that comes through, we'll pop it in here with this group. And again, this is an estimated um, balances. So the equipment placement reserve uh, estimated 748. Uh, Parkland acquisition reserve 79,000. Capital Reserve, $329,000. Uh, municipal Wharf, $518. And the Community Forest Legacy Fund, $1.2 million. The other thing I promise with this section is we're going to go through these, these uh, non-statutory reserves and we're either going to find out what they've been collected for and if there's still that intended purpose for them. And if not, then we'll move them or push them to surplus or whatever. Uh, there's an awful lot of them. Um, so we'll, we'll go through these here. Uh, general surplus, we're estimating at $1.3 million. Uh, provision for assessment adjustment, 11,000. And I believe the, the way we use that one is if uh, we have a, a supplementary roll come through in the middle of the year and it pulls away from our revenue, then we have some money that we can uh, make our taxes whole for that year. It's a, it's a small amount here, but. Uh, building reserve, $14,000. Uh, provision for by-election, and I'd like to change the name of this to election reserve. And so the intent there would be to put like, if we know our our Elections cost us forty grand every four years. We're going to put ten thousand dollars a year into this instead of having one big hit and then zero for the rest. Mayor Seegers, would we also use this account for referendums, AAPs, etc.? Um, if we put some money in for it, yes. Yes. Yeah. Right now, the budget includes, I think, a seventy-five hundred dollar transfer in here to cover help cover the next election. But if we want to up that a little bit to cover for AAPs and things like that, for sure. Yeah. We may need to do that. Um, then reserve for future expenditures. It should be cleaned out this year. And then you'll see through the year-end process, there'll be a new number come into that. And that's the way we carry projects forward from year to year. So if we haven't finished a few projects, um, we transfer the funding into here and then we draw it back out for uh, 2020. And then the community building reserve, uh, 5,900. So, you know, this one has a purpose. We're not sure if this is uh, an, active, an active project. And if it's not, then something like this, we think about trying to push over to like a building maintenance reserve or something. We'll define that and go through that through this process. Uh, community crime program reserve, 186,000. Development fee equalization reserve. This is an estimated number 263. And so this is a number, this reserve is uh, something it's uh, highly possible we're gonna access this year again. We used uh, 140 last year, I believe, out of this reserve. and we may need to uh, look at this reserve again this year. Uh, GIS operating reserve, uh, 26,000. Strategic community investment reserve, 75,000. Um, Corpus Bay government wharf, 23,000. Corpus Bay improvement reserve, 24,000. Um, not sure at this point what this one is, but we'll uh, define it as we go. Public Art Acquisition Reserve. Um, it was started sometime in the past and uh, we'll see what we can do with that. Uh, Public Safety Reserve, $501,000. And uh, this is the, the fund that 
we've been putting aside from RCMP savings over the last number of years due to being under under staff there. And uh, this is we did the roof with the part of this money this year. So I think last year this had eight hundred thousand in it. And we did the roof and something else. And, yep. Mayor Seegers. Interesting name on that first one. The community, community crime. crime programming re reserve. Yeah. We're looking to program for a community crime. Yeah. Be interesting Pass. to see what that what that is. Yeah. You know where the money came from and yep. how it went in there, what it's really supposed to be for. Yeah, we're digging up the previous motions and trying to define, redefine them, or you know, make sure we're current on that these are live projects and. And then um, the Public Works Operating Maintenance Reserve, uh, 60,000, Rockwood Improvement Reserve, 3,700. Um, you know, some of these um, could be accumulated into a building maintenance reserve instead of having a little bit for Rockwood and a little bit for, um, you know, this building or that building, and then contribute it to it every year so we have money to, to do some improvements. Um, solid waste uh, reserve, uh, 326. And once again, this is a, we estimated this one because um, we estimated to be a little higher because of the funds that we're getting from uh, the materials BC or the Recycle BC program. We didn't budget for getting $17,000 a year. So we're able to move some of that forward to into the reserve. It was a program we applied for in the middle of the year or partway through the year, and then we had our answer by June or July and started getting money. Uh, gas tax reserve, um, once again, this will move up to the statutory reserves next time. Uh, Trail Bay Wharf Reserve, uh, once again, there's two or three wharves here. Maybe they all can go into one uh, wharf reserve. Uh, downtown revitalization reserve, 59,000. Affordable housing reserve, 63. Um, we're going to bring back the community amenity reserve here coming up. Uh, we're about to get a contribution, so some money will go into that. And then uh, community forest dividend reserve. Um, when we get our re dividends from the community forest, we split them into two kind of pockets. Uh, one is goes into the legacy, and we 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 also take twenty five thousand and put it into operations, and uh, so this is accumulation of a number of years of that twenty five thousand dollars. Your figures. I th I thought some of like this reserve was actually used for CIP grants. Some of um, was it not, or how is that? So our our regular shareholder dividend that we get each year is $25,000. Yeah. That goes into here. Yeah. The other extraordinary dividends we get go into the other fund. Yeah, but I, I think it the I think it goes into this one here. Uh, and we have a spreadsheet that uh, that separates whether it's um, legacy or short term. Okay. I, I will I'll clarify We're going to need a mic, though, for Tom. Okay. <laughs> We're doing a live battery swap here. <laughs> so I'll, 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 uh, I'll make sure that we're very clear on that, um, whether that contains um, the short-term and long-term or just the long-term legacy. And... Um, <laughs> Matt, I've, I've just got a question. I'm, was the community forest able to work this year? Did they harvest any timber this year, this past year, in 2019? No. Yeah. And we'll be finding so out that, whether or not their forest stewardship plan has actually been approved. Yeah. So is that going to is, is that going to impact their ability to, uh, you know, to move funds to to the district of Seashell? Most likely. Yeah, and if, if I can jump in, depending on how long the community forest 
stops logging for, I think we need to look at some of these reserves that we have on our side to supplement the legacy fund program. But I think that's a conversation that's probably a year down the road. Yep. Good. Good. Okay, so um, the last slide with numbers on it uh, is just reviewing our asset numbers uh, uh, generally. Um, but the key here is to look how much is depreciated. Um, in some cases, you know, 50% or more uh, of our assets have been depreciated. And, um, you know, that really is a sign that that means that we're, our infrastructure is aging and at some point we're going to need to uh, replace it or um, put some major maintenance to it or, or whatever. But, uh, you know, you can see that, um, you know, the, um, the roads and the, the wharves and, you know, drainage are all, all increasing in age by a, a fair amount. So, you know, part of, uh, part of what we want to talk about is the long term and, and what does that look, look like from, a, you know, financial perspective. So when we get to capital again, we'll bring this slide back and we'll, we'll talk about, uh, you know, a little bit more about the long range planning there. So what's next? So this, uh, this meeting is really to get a base on some of our numbers and, and where the assessments went this year. Um, at the next meeting, um, we'll have um, a draft operating budget in detail and uh, we'll have supplemental sheets as well uh, that the department heads will then walk through. Um, I'll give, uh, my plan is to give you everything at once and then you'll bring that back to each meeting as we go through each department. Um, and uh, once we start going through the departments, we'll get to know how much time we'll need for each department and, and know better how to, um, how to plan our meetings out as um, you know we will either find that departments will need 10 minutes or an hour each and if they need an hour each we'll have to we'll have to look at uh, scheduling more meetings um, as we go forward here but uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean we could have longer days too so there's a mix there we could talk about right so we'll uh, include a summary of the operating budget uh, changes so we um, will tell you what basically is in that $1.1 million deficit from one year to the other. And um, so you see that up front. Um, part of it will be the lack of revenues and part of it will be increases in expenses. Um, we also have what they used to call one-time charges or one-time um, costs in the budget. We'll review those at that coming up to the next number of meetings by department. Um, we we'll also want to invite the RCMP and library in to present their budgets. And um, if I can, I'm going to try and start with them. And if they're not available, then we'll, we'll just go into our departments. And, um, and we'll um, department budget reviews. So each department head will come up and, and go have a PowerPoint presentation, a short presentation, walk through their budget, any additions they're looking for, talk a little bit about their operations, and uh, then we'll move on from there. And then uh, soon we're gonna have to just talk about um, having additional meetings for budget or longer meetings or, you know, but we'll, we'll see how it goes for the first, um, first set of department meetings to see what kind of time we work get from it. So I'm gonna schedule a bunch of departments to come in and see how far we get. And uh, so hopefully it'll go well. So that's intended to be in two weeks that we'll start that. Perfect. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was a very good high level overview of the budget. Um, I, for one, am looking forward to digging into the nitty gritty a little bit. Um, but this kind of stuff is important to put it all in context. So I'm going to open it up to any discussion or any other comments that council may have. Not seeing much, so I'm going to jump in with one question I did have from the presentation. 
Um, you presented a couple examples from other communities. Um, I'm just wondering how those communities were selected as examples. Um, <clears throat> mostly um, comparable in values, like house values, and that they had a high regional component to that they were paying to the regional district. Because often when you see that, that means the region is you know, sir, uh, covering a lot of, sharing in a lot of the costs of the community. Ours is quite high. And that's because the regional does recreation and they do, you know, other services, shared services, like, you know. And um, so that, those were my two main points that, you know, the values were in the six to 700 range for houses, the average, and that they had a large regional component to it. Perfect, thank you. Anyone else? Then I think that concludes 5 1. Oh, Tom, did you have anything? Well, I was just, you know, when it goes right back to the reserves, when, you, when they were talking about, uh, like, the road reserve being uh, zero, and that's because we're spending that money on Trail Avenue this year, so we're using all our reserves for Trail Avenue. That's correct, yes. Okay. Very good. That, that's all I had. Thank you. Great, let's move on to item 5.2, Procurement Policy 2.9.4. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think we need to receive a report. Oh, sorry. I'm getting on the right page, <laughs> sorry. Um, okay, so would somebody like to move receipt? Mayor Seegers, Councillor Toth, all in favor of receipt? Aye. Okay, perfect. And I'm gonna pass it over to the Director of Financial Services. Thank you. Um, we have... Um, a couple of purchasing policies here uh, currently. One is a council policy, and the other one is a is a guide for staff. and And um, it was it the one policy is included here at the back. And um, you know, my comfort is that you know council knows and has a, a is a participant in the purchasing policy. Um, currently, the the one policy we have now, there's not a lot of participation for council. Um, it says the CEO can approve any any dollar value basically for purchase. And I, you know, I think that um, council should have, you know, uh, a point at which they can interject into the purchasing policy process. And so that was probably one of my main focuses of, of redoing the purchasing policy. The other, the other reasoning would have been for uh, social procurement is becoming uh, more of a hot topic with many municipalities, so I wanted to inject uh, social uh, procurement, I don't know what you call it, principles within the purchasing policy. Um, some municipalities are way further advanced than this, but uh, we need to get started and we need to start incorporating um, social procurement. And uh, as we go forward, we'll continue to revisit that portion of this, and, and if we feel um, the time is right, we'll bring it back to enhance our social procurement uh, aspects of uh, our purchasing. So, um, pro procurement policy 293 was um, was adopted in 2015, and um, so it's it's four or five years old now, and there were, it was a bit dated in some of its topics, and so. Um, what I did is I've reviewed several other purchasing policies and um, made some changes, kept some of the, the information that was in our current purchasing policy and, and made some changes to what is more current today, uh, which includes the, um, the social procurement and, um, and making sure that uh, council has, um, is injected into the process of purchasing at some point. And so, um, Purchasing policy number 2.94, uh, I believe, uh, satisfies those those uh, conditions that I was looking for. As you go through the purchasing policy, um, the sustainable and pro pro social procurement uh, starts in 1.13 of the policy, and I believe that's page 15 of your agenda. And um, 
But the, the bigger and more substantial part of that is in Schedule C, Social Procurement. And um, it includes um, social values um, that we are to be watching when we do procurement and includes um, social value considerations when we're about to uh, give contracts. So if anybody has any questions, um, I'd be glad to take them. All right, questions. I believe we have Councillor Toth. On the top of page 16, uh, item 2.1, it mentions that all purchases of goods and services must first be authorized through approval slash amendment of the financial plan bylaw by council, except for emergency items. So even though there are these limits here, uh, it doesn't mean that the day after we approve this policy, our CAO can go out and spend $240,000 on something if it's not in the plan, correct? Correct. Thank you. If it's in the financial plan, he can approve up to 250000 and then it has to come to council. Policy, the policy also states that if, if um, anything that isn't included in the financial plan will have to come back to council. Perfect. Any other questions? Um, one question I have, um, which for the SCRD reps, um, passing off the um, authority for larger purchases is something I believe the SCRD does. Um, have you noticed any concerns with that process or does it seem to work fairly well? They, they come and give us a report every quarter of every um, expenditure, I believe 50, 000, above 50,000 in certain areas and others 100,000. So they, anything above that, they come. If it's, it, again, same thing as here, if it's not approved in the budget, it has to come to the, to the board for approval before being moved forward. So they're pretty rigorous around that. Yeah, I don't, I, they follow a fairly similar process. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? I'm gonna throw it in with a quick comment. Um, I'm really liking the looks of this social procurement policy. Um, in particular, the focus on local purchasing. Um, I think when we look at, some of the contracts that we put out are quite big and the potential for economic development with those contracts is quite big as well. So if we are using our money to help these local businesses in a fair and transparent manner, that's something that's really good in my book. So I think this process will help create that fair process where we can hopefully support our local economy a little bit more. I just wanna say, yeah, I totally agree with Matt. It's something I've said before in the past that I always want to try to support our local um, suppliers, vendors, um, and create, you know, a better economy in, in the situation. So reading over the social value considerations, I think it's a great addition. So. Seeing nothing else. Well, Mayor Seegers. So part of that uh, social procurement piece is inside of the criteria for you while evaluating uh, projects as they, or, or purchases as they're moving forward. Where do you get the criteria? Because that's, from, from the information that I've gathered and the workshops and things that I've, I've had on this, they said the hardest part is to actually put the criteria together so that it's fair, transparent, and actually ac accomplishes what you want it to do. So I, I mean, I know there's that group on Vancouver Island that has put some of that together. Where do we get that information so that we can actually use it to get to the results that we want? Yeah, the good question. I mean, we're probably going to be following their lead and or uh, getting involved with them, uh, with social procurement, and, you know, find out how they're wrestling these things to the ground as well. And, uh, but the key is to have, you know, if you have a checklist or, a, you know, you're doing a, some kind of a spreadsheet to put values to some of the terms in the contract, that you're certainly going to have one or two that are, or social procurement, you know, aspects to them, and then they may be, you know, uh, living wage, or they may be, you know, local, local employment, or 
you know, but it'll be known and it'll be evaluated across all all bidders on projects. Yeah, so just to follow up on that point, um, I, I think I would encourage staff to pursue that relationship with, I, I believe it's an AVICC group that's um, doing that research around social procurement. Um, because at the end of the day, we do need to get the best value for our money and make sure that we're doing it in a fair process. And I think that's one of the main things that they're focusing on. Um, so I look to staff to explore what they need to do to get involved with that process. If we pass this policy. Okay, I think we're ready for a motion. Would somebody like to move something? I'll move recommendation two and three. Okay, we have recommendation two and three that council approve procurement policy 2.9.4 and that council rescind procurement policy 2.9.3. Do we have a seconder? Mayor Seegers. Uh, any further comments, questions? All in favor? Aye. And that passes. So now we're going to move to our amended agenda, item 5.3 and the delegation. Um, delegations have 10 minutes to present. I'm seeing confirmation from the corporate officer, so we'll be keeping an eye on the time. And we welcome up Jerry Patterson. Good afternoon, Council. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak this afternoon. My key points are procedure and procedural fairness. What we have uh, experienced is in this community is a bit of challenges with the proper process, proper procedure, and, and procedural fairness. One of the issues that came up that does tie to this particular agenda regarding the budget is yesterday I attempted to pick up five copies of the agenda for taxpayers and residents within this community. And I was denied free copies. And for each of the agendas for this budget meeting, um, for members of the, of the community that are longtime residents and longtime taxpayers paying a lot of money, is I had to pay $18.50 for each copy of this agenda relating to the budget in order to provide members of our community information regarding this meeting. The thing that became very frustrating, and again, is kind of a, a challenge for an aging community, which we know that we all have, I happen to be one of them, is that the majority of this information that was inc is included in this agenda is of such a small font, so small, that I couldn't read it, and people were trying to read it with their magnifying glasses, and they were having challenges. So. It's a problem. Then we're here, and information is being presented on the screens, which again is, hey, um, I wear glasses, but I still could not read a bunch of the information in the, in the um, documents that when they were first presented. So it's a challenge, and I would really request that this council and the District of Seashell staff respect the members of the community, some that are here, um, many that aren't, that are trying to be involved and do have an interest, but you know what, is they have to be able to access the documents. It's really difficult, and I didn't ask, um, for one person that has a monthly income of less than $1,000 who's trying to sit there and keep her home, trying to keep going, really wanted a copy of this agenda, and I delivered it to her, and no, I didn't ask her to repay me the $18.50. I absorbed that cost. So the thing is, is that if you want public engagement and you want to interest, is that you have to sit there and provide an opportunity to the public to engage, to be informed, and to be aware. It's disappointing to realize that once I got to this meeting that there's a PowerPoint presentation with information that is not contained in the agenda. And I understand from hearing from other people is, is that, oh, gee, you can go to the inter internet and get copies of the information that was put on presented today in a PowerPoint presentation. Once again, is, is that I've said this before and I'm going to say it again, there are many people in this community that do not have access to internet. 
So they can't go to the website, they can't read it, they can't look at it, and so they are therefore denied this information. Is that fair process? Is that fair procedure? And is that procedural fairness for the people in this community who live here and pay big dollars in taxes to sit there and keep this municipal hall running and the staff running? I would respectfully request a little bit more consideration for people in the community that would like to be involved and would like to be able to read something if it wasn't so small and would like to be able to accept access getting documents without having to be charged a dollar a page or 1850 plus taxes for this document that we couldn't read. So that's my one comment. Um, my next comment relates to the budget and certainly I, it was interesting to realize that uh, our value of our roads have depreciated by 52%. One of the things that comes again to process, procedure, procedural fairness is, is that some areas in this community are maintained, others aren't. I happen to live on Norwest Bay Road or have property on Upper Norwest Bay Road, and guess what? Our roads aren't maintained. We've got McLaughlin Road, I think one of the neighbors counted 92 potholes uh, in 500 feet. You know, it doesn't get maintained. Uh, the drainage hasn't been maintained. There's blockages in drainage. I've been requesting drainage work for months. And there's a problem. It's a huge problem, but does it occur? No, but I see uh, what we did experience is that previously the public work staff brought trucks and machines up a couple times, and they did clear in front of a neighbor's property in the spring and summer, one property only. And they did not clean any of the other neighbor's ditches or properties. Selective service at the cost of other taxpayers and residents is not okay. This comes again to proper process, proper procedure, and procedural fairness. Talking about a couple of the items that came up on, in the budget today, and one was brought forward by Mayor Seegers. As a resident and taxpayer, I do not agree with the uh, fund for elections also being used for alternate approval processes. I think that funding should be separate. I would also like to request that when you're reviewing the budget and the members of the council, certainly staff, is, is that uh, you have a close look at your budgets and ensure that there is adequate funding to provide adequate service for roads, drainages, and existing infrastructure. Um, because there's a major project going on and all the money has been redirected to that, that leaves the rest of us with a problem. And how is that fair? Is that procedurally fair? So we're struggling because we don't have drainage on our properties. We're struggling because we don't have adequate roads. It is a problem. And so we're asking that the council look really closely at this. Another issue that's come up in the community, and I know because we spoke about it before, is the demands on the resources, limited resources of our RCMP. The demands on their time and energy are, have increased massively in the last 12, 18 months. And we're asking that the District of Seashell staff and the council sit there and look very carefully at how they're going to increase and fund RCMP so that there's adequate RCMP resources and services in, in Seashell. Uh, people, events have passed and the RCMP have not been able to respond. Uh, in one case that I'm personally aware of is it took five days for the RCMP to respond to a call. So what we're seeing is, is that the RCMP, which we admire and respect, is that they are, the demand on their time and resources far exceeds their ability to respond. So as the District of Seashelt is one of the primary financial uh, supporters or funders of our local RCMP, we are seriously requesting that the district staff council ensures that our RCMP are properly funded again to ensure the safety and security of people in this community. That's my comments. Thank you for your time. All right. Um, so uh, thank you for, for your presentation. I'm going to open it up to questions from council and then we can have a little bit of discussion about some of the concerns that you brought forward. So I think Mayor Seegers has the first question. Thank you. So you've brought forward a number of items that, yes, are budget considerations. So the question to you is, what percent increase would you be willing to entertain to cover those off? Because one of the things in the presentation, it said a 1% tax increase is $92,000. Well, 
So there are demands on resources of RCMP. One RCMP officer is what, 120, 150, 180, somewhere in there? So we're looking at one and a half to two percent increase for one RCMP officer. So what, what would you entertain as an increase on your taxes to allow us to cover some of these off? Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Seegers, for the question. Um, it's something I would have liked to address, but I was restricted to 10 minutes. Is what we're looking at as we're, as members of the public and myself personally, looking at the District of Seashell, the function of staff and how money is spent and not spent, is that I don't think that we're necessarily looking at having uh, increases in taxes. What I think that we need to look at, and you're frowning at me, is, is that we need to look at more effective uh, use of the resources that are being spent. I personally have watched and observed um, the time that has been spent on some of the issues in this community, that if proper process procedure and procedural fairness have been in utilized from day one is a significant amount of staff time and resources would not have been wasted. Those are taxpayer dollars. So what I would like to sit there and see again, a tightening up of process, procedure, and procedural fairness so that things aren't going around and around and turning into a big mess that is absorbing massive amounts of time, staff time and resources. Follow up. Go ahead. So are you saying the RCMP aren't being effective in what they're doing? Because you're saying we need more RCMP. I'm addressing that. I get we are looking at processes in our internally all the time, and we've taken what you've said, um, and we're looking at that. But RCMP, are they not following proper processes? Because an RCMP officer would be about a 2% increase. An RCMP officer is, if there are 2% increases, that we might sit there and see an increase in your budget costs related to the increasing um, support to the RCMP. But I do believe, from what I have seen and what I have observed and what I have documented, that there are certainly many places within the District of Seashelt use of resources and taxpayer funds that could be, uh, could cut back on the expenditures. Um, there's some comments that I could make, but I don't think it's appropriate to put them on, uh, on public record at this point. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Any discussion about some of the items brought forward? Okay, um, I think I'll jump in then if no one else has anything. Um, I, I think the point around um, establishing procedure is completely a valid one. Um, the comment about um, receiving the agendas is concerning. Um, and I think we need to look at what is our process for that and maybe getting it down in writing so it's very clear to everyone um, what we can expect um, uh, in terms of printing agendas. Uh, um, I, I'm speaking right now, I'll recognize sure. you um, at once I'm done. Um, so yes, I think we need more process in writing, more procedures, more policy, get it in writing, make it clear, and that will hopefully bring a more efficient government because everyone knows how we operate. It's in writing. Um, so I think that's a conversation that I'd like to continue to have with staff. Um, yeah, I'll stop there and go to Mayor Seegers. Okay, from what I understand, yes, there were five copies requested. Um, our policy is that you can get a free copy. Um, it was requested that though the others that wanted them, all they had to do was phone in and give us their name and we could provide the copies and they refused to do that. So the extra copies were charged for. Yeah, so as a response to that, I think we just need to get more of that in writing, make it a little more clear um, to everybody. And, and, and uh, Councillor McLean, just to respond to that, is that the District of Seashell has a bylaw called the Fees and Charges Bylaw, number 575-2019 is very clear about what can be charged for and not charged for and the rates that are charged. The bylaw fees and charges bylaw number 575-219 does not include um, any uh, provision for charging for uh, bylaws. Uh, to the Director of Finance? Oh, no, okay. Um, I think in response to that, it provides provision for printing, um, which is what I suspect happened. Um, but what I think we need to be more clear is on the specifically agendas and minutes 
what we want to see with that process because I, I don't believe the bylaw is fully clear there. So. And again, to, to respond to you, Councillor McLean, is, is that you remember back on December 4th that you brought the issue forward in your report and your statements regarding how to expand and improve communication with the general public. And so one of the ways to increase and improve communication with the general public is to provide access to the public to information such as bylaws, agendas, without a, co without a charge. Um, I was also charged um, for a copy of the bylaw of foreign council procedures. I was charged $10 for that. I was uh, charged $6 for another bylaw. And the, what the precedent that has been established, and I think it's supported by the Local Government Act and Community Charter, is that any um, uh, bylaw that a member of the public would require or request is provided at no charge. And that has historically been the same with uh, public agendas. Now, one of the things is that in, the, in your bylaw that I referred to is it does specifically name uh, the OCP and the zoning bylaws having charges associated with it. And yes, they're very large documents, so one can perhaps understand that. Um, but it is a bit of a concern that if a member of public has a concern or wants some knowledge or awareness of a public bylaw that is imposed upon them as a resident or business owner in this community, that in order to obtain that information, that they are then charged for the bylaw. So it's basically, if you're talking about process and procedural fairness, if you want your residents, businesses, visitors to comply with your bylaws and they are trying to become educated and informed on those bylaws, is perhaps imposing charges as you did yesterday, it cost me over $142 um, to obtain documents for your taxpayers and members of the public, is for many people that's a frustration that, and the cost is something that they would not be able to entertain. Thank you for your comments, I think they've been heard um, and I think we need a little more discussion with staff uh, after this meeting specifically on agendas and minutes. Um, and I think um, this council passed that fees and charges by law. So I think we knew the expenses um, that we would be incurring for other documents. Um, Councillor Toth. And, and in fact, we did have a discussion around agenda printing when we looked at the fees and charges by law. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely have to have a further discussion there. Okay, and any, if there's not anything else from council, I will. Thank you, Jerry, for pre presenting and asked for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Scott, Councillor, I'm going to go to Lamb. <laughs> All in favour of adjournment. Passed. Aye. And now we move into public questions. Pam.